like to introduce um, uh, Dr. Edward Snyder and Ms. Jill uh, Aliuka. Um, Edward Snyder is a professor of laboratory medicine. He's the director of the YNHH Blood Bank and Blood Bank Director at Bridgeport Hospital. He has over 360 publications and has served on numerous study sections. He's currently on the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee. Dr. Snyder has been a member of the COI committee for over 10 years and chair for five years. And uh, Ms. Kaliuka has been director for the COI office for over 10 years. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the, um, it's interesting you said you reviewed the slide for conflicts of interest and there were none, so I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the purpose of this is actually to let you know uh, that, uh, as they say, the whole world is watching. Um, everything we do, uh, certainly in a university of this size, has come under increased scrutiny. And the conflict of interest office, which is so admirably led by Ms. Paliuka, um, our job, I chair, I chair the committee, um, she runs the office, she does the bulk of the work, uh, is to basically protect uh, the university and protect you so that you don't you do not wind up as the lead story in the Yale Daily News or the New York Times. Um, there's a lot of interest in going from bench to bedside um, and then from there to the market. And along the way, there's a lot of Scylla and Charybdi that you guys can, and ladies can fall into. Um, it's a um, difficult issue. And the committee has changed over time, as you'll see. Uh, we keep current and we're ready to welcome the uh, opportunity to talk to you. This is interactive. If you want to ask a question, if I don't know the answer, which is likely we have the, uh, the Delta Oracle over here, we can answer just about anything. So um, this is to, to get you to understand and not to be soporific, but to tell you what, what uh, things you need to know. Uh, for my conflict of interest disclosure, I'm running a couple of clinical trials on pathogen induced red cells. Um, I did, we did a study also hyper on uh, pathogen induced platelets, which has been uh, Finished, and then I'm on a board of uh, human edits, but I don't get any honoraria from them or any equity. This public has no uh, external interests. So the conflict of interest office um, is um, uh, appointed and is advisory to the provost. We meet once a month at the provostial level with a variety of people, the Office of General Counsel um, and um, several of the provosts, um, and to discuss issues that were raised at the committee level. Uh, the committee composition, there's 13 uh, females and 12 males, 25 members, 17 voting, 8 non-voting, um, 10 medical school, 2 FAS faculty, and 23 administration. The medical school has the preponderance because the medical school is the biggest concern. We're less concerned about faculty in, let's say, theater that may be designing a set for a Broadway show and getting six figures to do that than we are about an investigator getting $12,000 doing a clinical trial for a company that's sponsoring the trial because human suffrage is involved. That's the key. Since you guys and, and women deal with um, urologic issues, Urolo urologic issues are human generally, and uh, that's a concern, as you will see. Um, the, uh, we advise the leadership on the uh, implementation uh, of the policy. Um, we uh, review faculty requests to serve on boards of directors, and that's including not-for-profit boards of directors. A key thought, and a lot of you folks are going to be asked to be on boards of directors, do not commit to being on a board and then come and ask us if it's okay. Because we have had faculty members who have come to us and said uh, on a Tuesday that they need to let this company, this mega company, know by Friday. And the answer was no, you cannot uh, join that board. And there was a whole variety of reasons because they could not join the board and do their job because the board that they were joining impacted everything that they were responsible for. And all the research that was being done in this particular department went through this individual. And most of it was sponsored by the company upon whose board he wished to, to go. Uh, it doesn't work that way. It may have worked that way years ago, but uh, not now. So sooner rather than later, let us know what the issues are and if they can be discussed. We determine whether the uh, significant financial interests, and that includes uh, not to any degree, to that degree, but even if it's a not-for-profit board, we need to know, you know, let us know about it and we'll let you know if it's a problem or not. Uh, it determine whether significant financial interests uh, present COIs with uh, disclosures, university responsibilities, um, and how much how conflict should be managed. 
the way you deal with conflicts is either you, first of all, you disclose them. They have to be managed or they have to be reduced or eliminated. Eliminated is much more draconian. We try to avoid that at all costs and we don't make independent decisions. We are advisory to the provost. So we don't just sit in the corner and decide who shall and who shall, shall not. Um, activities reviews, uh, overall non-research responsibilities. Does the significant financial interest have the potential to affect academic teaching clinical responsibilities? We came to Yale with the express purpose of promoting the university, not to self-aggrandize. That often gets wrapped up that once you're here and everyone realizes how wonderful you are. And today with um, the ability to get things online, uh, promote books, promote uh, podcasts, promote t-shirts, whatever it is. And we have a, a Whitman sampler of all kinds of, I don't know how many people even know what a Whitman sampler is anymore. Most of you look blank, so apparently they don't. It was a box of chocolates that had all kinds of different things in it that used to eat years ago when the dinosaurs rolled the earth. Uh, anyway, so the question is, does the SFI have a potential to affect your academic teaching? Which is the, the thing I just mentioned earlier, this individual could not do his job the way things were structured. Transactional reviews, which are sponsored research project, does the significant financial interest directly and significantly affect, and it's the DCR, the design, conduct, or reporting. So if you are involved in the design or the conduct, including enrolling patients, reporting, which means publications, these are things we need to discuss. Um, and just, if you wanna do this and you wanna, get out of this by assigning responsibilities for enrolling to someone who reports to you and whose future you're responsible for, that, does, that's, you know, that doesn't work that way. It has to be somebody else. These are the kind of things we discuss. It's very complicated, very not often simple. Many times it is. So the sooner you tell us what you're planning, the sooner we can give you an idea of which is the right way to go. Um, and the transactional reviews, uh, we look at this, could the research affect, um, could, have, could this have an effect on the SFI itself and affect the objectivity of the investigator carrying out the research? Okay, so the university um, conflict of interest uh, policy, uh, conflict of interest exists when the individual has an SFI that could directly and significantly affect his or her activities. Generally, this will be when the external interest provides an incentive and again, also the opportunity to affect university decision or other activity. We have a, uh, there's conflict of interest for purchasing. Um, if you're involved with a company that uh, sells products to the university, uh, you should not be at the table discussing contracts. And we have a, a, a bunch of people, as you'll see in a second, there's a slide showing who attends the conflict of interest meeting to be able to provide input from all those different areas. So, Mitigating factors. Right now, the general policy that the university follows is uh, if you are involved with a clinical trial and the clinical trial, you are being remunerated by the company running the clinical trial that, um, and this is a not discussion and we've had lectures on this, uh, what is the level of involvement where you think someone really, the line should be drawn uh, in getting personal remuneration? Um, and we have a couple of examples at the end, which we can go over. Um, generally, the university caps at uh, what we say 10K. That is, if you have a clinical trial, you're getting remuneration from the company, and you're doing a clinical trial. If you're getting $9,000 from the company, usually that's, you know, all other factors equal, that seems to be okay. If, however, you're getting fifteen dollars or $20,000, it's not okay. And you say, well, where's the line drawn? What, why am I pure at 9,999 and 10,001? I'm, no, I'm, I'm not pure anymore. So as things became more involved, we developed a list of mitigating factors. And these mitigating factors are listed here. Um, in, in some of the highlights are, is it a multi, if you're doing a clinical study, is it multi-centered, randomized, blinded? Uh, is Yale the sole site? Are you uh, recruiting 90% of the patients? Um, is Yale a coordinating center? Um, as I said, less than 5% of the total study enrollment is kind of what we look at generally. Um, we're, are you involved in study design? Who's doing the data analysis? Is it someone in your lab or is it going to the white hats or something like that? Um, who's involved in the consenting process? Um, who's, who determines subject eligibility? Is there an independent DSMB? And a DSMB that consists of the principal investigator deciding what is and what isn't kosher, 
uh, so to speak, uh, it's not uh, doesn't go over often very well, depending on the situation. These are all things the committee considers. Uh, is the research designed to support new indications? Is it first in, in, in person, first in man? Um, other considerations are um, individuals' expertise. Is it unique to Yale? Is there no one else who could do this study because of expertise or uh, facilities or equipment that is specifically at Yale? Um, is the research in the best interest of patients? Um, and is the individual's influence over it? these kinds of things we look at and then we weigh them? So it's not just yes or no. And we have situations where people have gone over the cap, uh, and the caps vary. There's a cap of 5,000. The FDA has a cap of 25,000. Some places have a cap at zero. And some people feel there should be absolutely no personal remuneration whatsoever. For These are things we struggle with and what we discuss. And is that number on an annual basis? Is it for the entire? It's period? annually. It's annual. It's on a calendar year. OK. Okay, so this is the, uh, I thought this was a lovely slide actually, um, of who was actually at the meeting. We have uh, Yale Ventures in the lower left, looking, looking clockwise. We have the hospital, uh, which I kind of pushed for because we, we can't not have the hospital present in these meetings, uh, even though it's a university uh, uh, committee. Yale Medicine, the Office of Special Pro Sponsored Projects, the Institutional Conflict of Interest Committee. If Yale gets um, royalty payments or is involved in, in intellectual property uh, and the university is involved, uh, if things go well, they go well. If things go badly, they go south in a heartbeat. So we have to make sure that the institution is protected as well. There's a separate committee with a separate chair. Uh, Mark Imperio is the chair of that committee. Um, and that needs uh, to look at other issues where the university has uh, for human subjects. And again, we don't care if the guy who's making the theater design for this Broadway show wants to use blue paint as opposed to red paint. That's his problem and not the university because it's a clinical trial about the human and the university is getting royalty payments or something. The university needs to know and you know, we can make sure that they're protected. The um, uh, Office of Sponsor of um, Human Subjects Research Protection the IRB, and that's where the people who look at one of the, the um, um, bullets that we had on the uh, first slide uh, was um, that we're going to dis who discusses research integrity. That's not what we do. That's more what involved with the IRB and the uh, uh, Human uh, Research Protection Group, which we work with and sits at the table and we communicate. But if the question of integrity and is the is the clinical trial appropriate? That's not something we discuss. We look at the conflict of interest. So there's, there's different, we stay in our sort of in our own lane, but we communicate back and forth. Uh, the purchasing uh, conflicts, purchasing office, uh, the office of general counsel, and the uh, finding the conflict of interest leadership in the lower right, um, which is um, the Kavasu group that we report to uh, on a uh, monthly basis as well. So it's a full table. When we met uh, in person, we had 12 food. Uh, now we meet by Zoom and we eat electrons. So the responsible conduct of research, um, yearly we give lectures uh, such as uh, this um, to um, uh, let people know. Uh, we also discussed, uh, we, we met a couple of days ago to discuss with postdoctoral employees, the COI issues. COC is conflict of commitment. Conflict of commitment is something we aren't discussing right now. Um, it is becoming looked at more often. Um, we have some people who tell us that they, um, you know, spend 60, 70 percent of their time doing medical malpractice uh, expert witness testimony, testimony uh, testifying. Uh, that could be a problem. It's up to the department chair to determine if that's a conflict. You're paid to, to work at Yale and do the Yale stuff and not to go out and self-aggrandize. So these are issues that are being addressed and they're being, it's being looked at again to see what the process and commitments uh, issues are. You're allowed one day at seven for gainful employment. Gainful meaning for profit, I believe. So um, if you are, which is about 52 days a year. And um, we have some people who um, exceed that and some people don't come anywhere near that. So um, these are things we can discuss. We've had talks at the variety of medical school places. You're probably you know, listed there after you uh, up there on the second line. Uh, we give lectures to the uh, Faculty of Arts and Science chairs, uh, and also um, we discuss research compliant principles um, and I'll give other presentations, uh, you know, as necessary. Um, I think that was the last of my slides. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Paliuka, who will 
go into some more of the uh, details here. Thank you, Ed. So the mission of the Conflict of Interest Office is to administer and implement the university's conflict of interest policy and to uh, ensure compliance with the COI regulatory requirements, of which there are many and varying. Unfortunately, uh, one of the things conflict of interest professionals over the years have been really pushing for is standardization across all of the different uh, types of funding agency requirements, and um, we're still a long way from that. Um, we have not seen, um, they talked about uniform guidance, um, but, and we're still seeing work uh, in that area, which is why many people have to disclose different things to different places. And it's just sort of the, the state of, uh, that's the, the current state. However, there is a desire to move towards more uniformity and standardization. Um, part of our mission in carrying out our mission, uh, we oversee the external interest disclosure process for faculty and uh, those who are responsible for the design, conduct, or reporting of research, responsible personnel. We provide advice and support the activities of the conflict of interest committee in identifying and appropriately managing, reducing, or eliminating conflicts of interest. And we ensure that committee determinations comport with regulatory and institutional COI requirements. Um, we assess external interest disclosures to determine if outside significant financial interests could present conflicts of interest either with individuals' um, broader institutional responsibilities or with specific sponsored projects. And those are the transactional reviews that we uh, conduct. We communicate and monitor financial conflict of interest management plans uh, to the conflicted investigators. Uh, we educate and advise faculty, staff, and other stakeholders who are dependent on COI requirements and processes. Of course, uh, providing advice uh, to the leadership group, the Institutional Conflict of Interest Committee, leadership, um, informing them of concerns and emerging issues. We submit financial <coughs> conflict of interest notification <coughs> reports to sponsors. Primarily, the NIH has uh, regulatory requirements where we must submit financial conflict of interest reports to the NIH. We respond to public requests for information concerning financial conflicts of interest uh, reports submitted to uh, PHS. That is a mandatory and regulatory requirement. And we network with peer institutions and national organizations. Um, I'm going to get down into the weeds for a little bit and talk about the disclosure process at Yale, starting off with who is required to submit conflict of interest disclosures to Yale's conflict of interest office. All faculty with a greater than 50% appointment, anyone who's responsible for the design, conduct, reporting, or research. So anyone who's senior key personnel, for example, or anyone that PI determines is responsible for research. It could perhaps be a postdoc. And um, anyone who is a member of a research compliance committee is required to submit disclosure forms. The requirement um, in terms of what is disclosed would be any significant financial interests. And that varies depending on funding sources. Uh, the NIH, for example, has a general threshold if you're talking payments of anything greater than $5,000. The NSF, National Science Foundation, on the other hand, has a general threshold of greater than $10,000. Across the board, though, things like uh, equity stake, equity holdings, ownership interests in a privately held company always uh, require disclosure. Uh, that seems to be pretty standard. So we have a few standardizations there. Any fiduciary roles for outside entities. So things like board of directors, any of your C-suite type of positions. And that would be whether they are paid or unpaid for a nonprofit organization or for a commercial venture. <clears throat> and then intellectual property rights, uh, even if they're not generating income. Intellectual property rights may not be considered to be financial interest. Perhaps they're not generating any income yet. Or maybe it's uh, income that's below one of the thresholds I talked about. However, uh, the uh, 
human subjects portion um, takes into consideration, so the IRBs and the HRPP takes into, consider, into consideration intellectual property rights when they're looking at human subjects research. Do we have investigators who are in the position of evaluating their own intellectual property? And as you can imagine, that can create conflicts even though a significant financial interest does not yet exist. The um, disclosure is an annual requirement, at least annually, and then to update within 30 days of acquiring new significant financial interests. So if you take on a new consulting gig, we need to know about that within 30 days. Um, if you um, formed a new startup venture and you're a founder, co-founder, we need to know about that as well. Um, so it's new significant financial interest acquisition or material changes in one's Yale responsibilities. So um, perhaps you've been recently appointed as a section chief and that's a new administrative role that you didn't have previously. And those types of uh, changes can impact um, decisions that you make at the university. And so we need to know when determining relationships that, that those roles exist. There um, are multiple disclosure requirements here at Yale. So in addition to the process I just talked about, there's also a senior administrative disclosure. And that is administered through the office of the vice president and general counsel. And they reach out to employees who can make or influence decisions regarding auditing, purchasing, contracting, et cetera. And they um, reach out to those folks individually. They have a separate disclosure that they submit to the office of general counsel. Um, as some of you sitting around the table, uh, may know there is also a disclosure requirement through uh, the Yale Payment Health System, and um, they have an office that administers those requirements. I believe they sent out a survey around Valentine's Day this year, so you may have seen that already. Ed already spoke uh, about the COI leadership group, um, and so often if there are challenging or uh, difficult cases, scenarios that we're looking at at the COI committee level. We will um, speak with COI leadership group. Um, certainly that group is also involved in policy review and development. Ed mentioned the Institutional Conflict of Interest Committee, and uh, they look at institutional significant external relationships, and also the significant financial interests of university leaders. So whether a department chair, for example, has a related financial interest in uh, human subjects research, or if the PI who reports to the department chair and through the chain of command, we're also looking at the significant external relationships of leadership. Um, the policy and procedures, um, the scope is limited to institutional conflicts in human subjects research. Ed um, talked about conflict of commitment and uh, mentioned that deans and department chairs are responsible for reviewing and determining if there's a conflict of commitment. It's not often a formulaic decision, you know, uh, and the department chair or at the local level knows best um, is the faculty member fulfilling their responsibilities or our outside interests, even if they're five days a year, if they happen to be on the same five days, that compete with one's uh, responsibilities or classes or clinic, a conflict of commitment could exist. And the process for reporting outside financial interests, outside activities that we see in disclosure forms uh, and sharing reports of that information with deans and department chairs is under review. So Some future enhancements. Um, that are under consideration in terms of the disclosure requirements um, may be expanding the population. Um, as I said, currently only faculty with a greater than half time appointment uh, submit disclosures. Uh, we're lowering the thresholds um, in part because of conflict of commitment. Um, and in part because some of the agencies are also starting to come in line with the NIH requirements. So 
as I said, NSF is a 10,000 uh, for a significant financial interest, but the disclosure form in the near future will query for greater than $5,000 regardless of funding source. And there are going to be some additional uh, disclosure elements that relate to external activities, but perhaps not necessarily conflict of interest. So um, leadership has decided they want to use one form to capture um, all of the required information rather than having people submit different forms through different systems. Um, so things like uh, elements related to in-kind support, additional travel disclosure requirements. Um, there is um, a concern around uh, research security. Um, some of you may have heard of it as foreign influence. So um, things like uh, faculty involvement in the Thousand Talent programs. And, you know, is US research uh, being shared uh, when it shouldn't be? So there are a lot of considerations and a lot of changes coming through the regulatory world, which will then dictate changes that we need to make to our disclosure form. So keep uh, we will keep the community informed of that. Um, we're in the middle of designing, redesigning the form. Um, one thing we did too was try to explore if we could harmonize the university and hospital disclosures into one, but we have not been able to do that. I would say that we're probably still several years away because of different requirements, but that is something that we are sensitive to and we understand the burden <laughs> having to submit separate disclosures and different content. Um, so if um, others have suggestions on how we can improve or areas that they would like to see, give me a shout. I'm happy to uh, uh, take any and all requests. And uh, what we can do to improve and ease the burden is kind of one of our most do you share information across? Good question. Um, we do share certain information across. So for example, um, <clears throat> we have what we call a YNHL medicine, YNHH disclosure template, where we would inform the hospital's chief of staff that uh, you know Professor Smith disclosed a significant financial interest with company X. We do not divulge the value of that, the dollar amount, but, um, and, and we let you know because we provide to you the template that says we're going to share this information. We do share information with the uh, HRPP. They actually have um, access to the CLI database because they need to have that information when they're looking at financial interests in the context of the human subjects uh, safety to human subjects, they look at through that lens. Um, they're also looking at it um, in terms of um, objectivity in research, as are we. We're looking at objectivity in, in research. Um, when we're looking at transactional reviews, sponsored projects, that's our main question. Is there incentive and opportunity that could then impact the objectivity of research? Um, so, yeah, there is some sharing of information, but not full out, here's a copy of the disclosure form, go wild. Um, and in terms of the types of financial interests, you know, these include honoraria, consulting fees, uh, folks serve on scientific advisory boards, at expert witness activities, patents, licenses, intellectual property, equity, and then, as I mentioned earlier, fiduciary responsibilities, even if they are unpaid, Yale policy treats an unpaid seat on the board of directors as a significant financial interest. Um, and that is in part because our process is such that if one discloses a significant financial interest, we will do one activities review. Do the outside interests um, influence broader institutional responsibilities? And then we may be doing 20 transactional reviews on sponsored projects, depending on how uh, prolific uh, the faculty uh, member is um, and, and how large their research portfolio is. Make sense? Any questions so far? 
<clears throat> okay, so this is the transactional review uh, required that I just spoke of. We have, uh, we know that when the sponsored projects come in for NIH at JIT, COI office receives an alert, and we know that we need to start doing a conflict of interest review, and we do that at JIT so that when you get your notice of award, if there is a conflict, hopefully we've already identified it, managed it, worked with you on a management plan, and then we don't have to hold up the award setup. And um, Ed spoke about the limit for um, $10,000 if, if you're involved in human subjects research and your outside financial interests are found to present a financial conflict of interest with the human subjects research. One of the management plan elements um, would be to cap or limit that income to no more than $10,000 per calendar year. And we see cases where individuals either have a number of different financial interests in the same entity, uh, we call those multiple ties, or they can have uh, different uh, relationships with multiple entities. So intellectual property, uh, we already spoke to the fact that intellectual property, even though it's not a significant financial interest, does qualify for disclosure. And um, a, another area that uh, we spend a lot of time reviewing uh, is faculty involvement with startup ventures. So you know, in order to go from bench to bedside, you know, there's commercialization. That's part of the institution's mission, but that does generate and create uh, conflicts of interest. So faculty can, and many do, hold equity interests in startups that license intellectual property, put in place a management plan when they're doing related research. Any equity interest in a startup company is considered to be a significant financial interest. So um, actually any equity interest in a non-publicly traded entity is uh, a significant financial interest. So that's important to the regulations and Yale's policy. And um, there may be times when uh, the ability to conduct research sponsored by a startup venture, especially if it's human subjects research may be restricted. So your role on that research may be restricted or you may not be able to be um, an investigator on the IRB protocol. It really depends. We look at all of these on a case-by-case -case basis. They all have different uh, facts and <coughs> nuances. So uh, I'd be to uh, very carefully review in coordination with the IRB. Another take-home is that uh, board directors that I mentioned requires prior approval. Uh, when it's uh, a board seat for a commercial venture, whether it be a startup company or any other for profit. Uh, if one holds an administrative role at Yale, for example, a section chief or a department chair, uh, the requirement to obtain prior approval uh, before accepting a board seat applies to any entity. Uh, and uh, a, a Big area we see is that a Yale faculty member may not serve as an office of startup or any other company while not on the The um, concern around fiduciary roles and responsibilities outside of Yale or is, is that those in a fiduciary capacity, you are obligated by law to act in the best interest of that company. And that can compete with what you are required to do here at Yale. As a PI on a Yale project, you're required to act in the best interest. You're almost a fiduciary for that project. So sometimes these roles can be to a conflict. And um, Yale's policy also calls out what we call high value significant financial interest, which uh, according to policy would be greater than $100,000. So, um, when we see high value significant financial interests disclosed, we may reach out to you for additional information or clarification. Um, and certainly a high value significant financial interest of $100,000, let's say, if you're conducting human subjects research 
that is related to the SFI entity. It could be sponsored by NIH, but maybe you're evaluating um, a compound or uh, an entity that you get consulting fees from you know, $100,000 and human subjects research where many of those mitigating factors or enough of those mitigating factors don't exist would create that patent in case scenario. We have a few examples of faculty who are doing human subjects research. All of the mitigating factors exist. So they have the incentive, but there's no opportunity for them to impact the object of research. Even in those scenarios we've said, then the limit becomes 100K because the, the optics around greater than $100,000 and related human subjects research, um, you know, it really doesn't uh, pass muster of the New York Times test, the optics around all of that. So we have a couple of scenarios where we've said to faculty, even though there's no conflict, because you don't have the opportunity to um, bias the objectivity of the research, <coughs> Limit it to a hundred thousand dollars. Those are rare. Um, the considerations um, that both the COI committee and the HRPP uh, review in terms of human subjects research, of course, the degree of risk. I've had an investigator who uh, is the inventor of intellectual property. It was the device they wanted to insert into, a, into the spine. And you know the committee said, no, um, someone else has to do this. The research was higher risk. Um, so that is one of the instances where the investigator was informed that they could not participate in the research. Those are um, uh, rare occurrences, but again, it's after careful consideration that uh, coordinated reviews. Uh, the phase of the trial counts, you know, is it phase one? Is it first in man? Is it phase two? These types of things uh, make a difference. Um, the other factors Ed already uh, discussed, so I will use again. And I will um, turn this back over to Ed for some case studies. Great. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll have a couple of quick case studies. There will be a, uh, a quiz and you will be graded. Um, at least you think that the faculty members aren't concerned about this. I have had a faculty member, when we told him he had a cap of 10K and he was making close to 100,000, that if this was enforced, he would have to get a divorce and leave Yale. As if I was supposed to melt on the phone and say, oh God, please, not that. Um, Eventually, it was worked out, but um, that was their concern. Many faculty aren't concerned about this until they're told they have to give up $90,000 worth of money coming into them personally in order to be able to do the clinical study because the human subjects involved. It gets everyone's attention very quickly. Um, the problem is, and you could argue the point, um, if you were a patient lying in a bed and, and um, the person sitting next to you came over to you and said, I just wanted you to know that uh, I'm doing research for this company where this drug we're giving you to, to improve your urothelial tumor. Um, I'm getting $200,000 in this company. Uh, some people might think, gee, that's wonderful. He's really involved in cutting edge research. Other is, it's, uh, someone else might think it's just a shit for the company and a uh, shill for the company and isn't a <laughs> shit for the company and just uh, uh, trying to make money. And I don't want him touching me at all because I don't, I don't trust him. These are very ethical issues and very difficult to uh, discuss, but uh, do not be um, <coughs> of, the, um, of the mind that you are not involved in conflict of interest just by walking in the door of a white coat on this case. So uh, these are things that you need to be aware, know where boundaries are, and know what some of the concerns are. We're here to protect you as well as the university. So first case, a researcher receives 100,000 from Martech, the PhD researcher sometimes prescribes the drug to patients and the PhD researcher, uh, and the researcher qualifies patients for a clinical trial. Is this a conflict of interest? This is the part of the show where we get from. Yes or not? Yes. Okay. And what, what dollar figure would you want this to be set at? Do you think 10,000 is reasonable? Do you want 5,000, 25,000? Now, what's your, what's your personal thoughts on this? Or zero? 
don't need to order anymore. I'll up there. I won't call on you again. But what are your thoughts? You think how many things are zero? That a person should get no personal remuneration for doing a clinical study with a role in patient safety. What is this person getting out of it? Getting a paper? Getting something to put on the CV where he's first or last? So when he goes to the uh, promotions and appointments and promotions committee, they get promoted. And they get swell opportunities to go off and give talks at key places and swell swell conferences and you become a big deal in your field. Or do you want to get hundred thousand dollars and give up the research? They would this person would have to cap the 10K if they wanted to take it at face value, unless there were a slew of mitigating circumstances. Okay. Since you enjoyed that so much, we'll go to the next one. <laughs> uh, assistant professor receives four thousand dollars from Armageddon Pharmacy. Uh, the assistant professor is PI. For a stage two clinical trial involving one of the compounds, is this a conflict of interest? You say yes. How many think it is? I want to see hands. Come on, hands. Yes. Okay. This is a conflict. Most of you do. Well, in reality, this is not something that the university considers conflict of interest. This doesn't need to be disclosed, uh, as a matter of fact, because it is it's below five thousand dollars. Right. Yeah, I would like to clarify though this that your consulting fees from Armageddon would be exposed to uh, our product interest disclosure. However, the IRB might require disclosure because they may put it in a consent form, um, you know, this something that subjects to them. So there are some people who think you should get zero dollars, four thousand, and other people think four thousand is chunk change. Many years ago, before some of you were born, probably, uh, we had grand rounds at Fitkin. And um, the woman who was the uh, editor of the New England Journal of Medicine came to lecture. This was at the very beginning of the, um, uh, I can't block your name, um, uh, at the beginning of this whole conflict thing. And uh, she was talking about conflicts and how at Harvard, you know, people aren't allowed to have post it notes with company names on it or pens or pencils or any of that. Which we given out. So one of the male faculty members stood up, and Marcia uh, she got up and said, "If you think that my um, personal um, opinion and my ethics can be altered by getting a pen or a, a notepad or a post-it note that has a company's name on it, you're sorely mistaken because that doesn't mean anything to me." And there was a hush in the audience. She looked at him and said, well, then you won't mind giving it up, will you? <laughs> he sat down and that was the end of the discussion. I was so impressed that even the minimum stuff like that is significant. So we're not talking about taking luxurious personal plane trips to Indonesia. Uh, we're talking about uh, you know, a post-it note and so forth. So that was the beginning is, from my perspective of things that's been starting. And then how many exposés have happened in the New York Times or uh, Sloan Kettering, where the chair of the, the hospital had to resign, uh, all of these things. You don't want to get into those kinds of uh, concerns. So this actually would, would be uh, uh, looked at, but not, uh, not as a, a big a deal. And it's based on the dollars to a large degree. Uh, so a professor is a startup, a founder of a new biotech startup. He owns 5% of the, or she owns 5% of the founder's equity and has several graduate students working in her lab on projects related to this. So is this a conflict we need to be concerned about? Yes. Good answer. Um, if you were a uh, grad student, and uh, let's say there are three grad students, and the, the, this uh, professor happens to be having one grad student work on a project specifically related to the company in which he has uh, equity interest, uh, and the other two don't, don't you think those other two might be a little concerned that there's favoritism there and someone's getting preferential treatment? Uh, and who do I talk to? We actually. Um, are aware of these kinds of concepts, and we have people who can they can be referred to directly that the studies and so forth uh, as a, as a um, fair uh, broker, um, someone who can, uh, a neutral party who they can go and discuss the different concerns. And we have had some issues. We have definitely had some issues in the So some of these can get pretty, uh, pretty serious. I think there's one more. Oh, well, these are the uh, lightning rounds. So the 30, 35% of an assistant professor's salary by the Garbanzo company goes to the Yale department to Dr. Kim for a phase three randomized clinical trial for which the assistant professor is PI. Yale broker agreement. Is this a conflict of interest that's concerned with the fact that he's getting a third of the cell, 35% of the cell? 
answer is not a concern because it's open to the department. It's not increased money to the, to the um, uh, investigator. It actually goes to Dr. Kent in my scenario, who then takes other monies that were being used to support that investigator's salary and use that money to replace that. Gives the chairman $35,000 more. It might say, just to you, pardon me, but all the simple part. To, to, to expand the department, hire the faculty, um, renovate, and so forth. So uh, if the money is a sponsored research agreement going through the university, so it's, it's basically uh, transparent to the investigator, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is okay. Because it's not getting 35% selling for him or her. Faculty members asked to sit on a nonprofit board of directors in the senior care business. Jill mentioned that that was a concern. So uh, that's something that we would look at. A, a physician is requested to join the board of directors of a pharma giant. I discussed how that actually has occurred multiple times and probably is occurring as we speak. Uh, physician faculty is asked to participate in the speakers bureau. Um, speaker bureaus are no-nos, not allowed to do speaker bureaus. And a speakers bureau is when you are the, um, the I'm not even sure anybody knows who Howdy Duty is. I, I once asked, does anyone know who Howdy Duty is? Some of you do, a couple of you. Some of you are looking like who? Howdy Doody was a, one of the world's most famous puppets uh, years and years ago. And um, uh, anyway, I want to go into the story. But um, basically, this is what a speaker's bureau is. The, the company gives you a talk, a deck, a slide deck, and you talk while other people do filet mignon at some swell water hole. That's a speaker's bureau. It is not intended to be that you go with the slide deck that uh, at a company. Um, at, at a conference, a national conference, that talk about research you're doing with the company before a company um, that's involved, as long as it's and it's reviewed. Now, you can't really go to major uh, speeches anymore without having your slide deck reviewed in advance, uh, which can present some uh, some issues for faculty sometimes because you worry about the safety. You don't want to send them your, your data that's not been published yet uh, because you have to send your data ahead of time for them to review and put it into a... Uh, a file that uh, is accessible by any of the attendees. These are things that has to be worked out. But speakers bureaus in the hospital was definitely a, a, that it's not acceptable at all for you in your favorite hospital. So all these uh, dinners at Sink and uh, all these other restaurants are uh, not good, not good. And they try to get around it by having the company gives the money to a speakers um, to a, uh, a uh, uh, some kind of an organization that sets up. Uh, these kinds of dinners. So they're saying, oh, I'm not being paid by Martag, you're being paid by the Garbanzo Entertainment Company, but the, the money's coming in. From, so, you know, we, we, we have ways of finding this stuff out. Faculty in the music department's a half a million dollars to write a score for a movie. Is that something that needs to be disclosed? Well, it needs to be disclosed, but it's not a conflict of interest. I believe it needs to be disclosed. There's over 5,000, and it's okay because they're not writing a score, you know, involving human subjects here. Uh, although it may be about human subjects, who knows? Um, so that's why uh, we have Nobel Prize laureates giving lectures for six figures. And uh, that's fine, enjoy. Uh, but if you have a, a human subject investigator uh, doing $12,000 and we're all of you, uh, you know, can't do that. So it's the human subject part that that's the concern. And lastly, a law faculty member, 50% of her time is an expert witness. We talked about conflict of commitment. Uh, and that's something that the department chair uh, would need to uh, need to address. So, in conclusion, uh, conflict of interest is a situation. It is not an indictment. You are not guilty until proven innocent. It's a it's a, a process of us talking to you to ensure that you realize that there may be some concerns and how can we work to, to help you do your your job at Yale, help the patient, and try to make everything a win win win. Transparency is key, and you disclosure is important. Everything should be transparent. We can mitigate it, we can manage it, or in extreme cases, eliminate it. And that's, that's as I say, pretty draconian. Um, and then uh, please contact the office. Uh, um, we have three or four senior people who are all um, very well adept at this. I'm still learning. I've been on the committee a long, long time. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's a critical aspect of what you do and we'll be involved in your futures, uh, if you say in academics, uh, going forward a lot. So with that, I'm going to stop. And any questions? And how would you want to? How would you like this to proceed? Whoever is in charge here. Thank you. Questions? 
the basic difference between disclosure and conflict of interest is just whether or not there are, uh, I guess, decisions impacted by the financial True. gain. True. Um, the difference is, uh, think of disclosure, you're not disclosing conflicts, you're disclosing related significant financial interests. So significant financial interests that relate to your area of expertise or your institutional responsibilities. So you're not necessarily disclosing a conflict, you're disclosing a significant financial interest. Someone else determines if it's a conflict. And um, again, it's, is there the incentive and the opportunity? Um, so with university activities, that's a little bit harder, you know, so we tend to uh, manage those types of things because you could be making a decision in an administrative role. Um, in terms of the transactional reviews, the measure is there's a significant financial interest, could it directly and significantly affect the design comment reporting and research? Um, and with that, um, those things are actually a little bit easier to assess because you have a specific scope of work. You can uh, ascertain if the outcomes of the research could inform the business interests of the entity in which you have a significant financial interest. And if that answer is yes, there's a financial conflict of interest. Did I answer that? Yeah. Uh, as the chair, how do I, if it's not disclosed to me, um, let's say like the case example of even with the conflict of commitment, sir, doing a certain amount of work outside, um, how would that, how would that very good yeah. question. Um, what we do currently is we copy the department chair on any financial conflict of interest management plans. So um, you're informed of the fact that there was a financial person in financial interest that created the conflict of interest. Um, university leadership is looking at uh, now uh, what aspects or elements of the disclosure form should be provided to department chairs and in what format. Should there be a quarterly report, for example, that uh, tells the department where the department chair can see, you know, uh, that Dr. Smith um, disclosed six entities in a total of 25 days and consults for one of them, somebody. Um, board of directors for another. So that's under consideration um, so that department chairs will have increased awareness. Yeah, you know, years ago we used to send the conflict of commitment information to chairs, but only one of them really, when we stopped, only one of them actually wanted to know where they were. So the individual actually wanted to see them. And, and I would be uh, very interested as department chair, what, it is, what is it that you would find useful? Um, so if you have any uh, comments on that. Yeah. Well, I think in general, those type of uh, outside activities with the um, those companies um, that uh, is there a conflict where they're spending some time outside right. their, their obligation to you. So that would be a five major concern. Um, the fact that you come here because they want to get the name, they want to put it on, put the logo on your uh, on your website. And, uh, you know, I do conflict of interest. I, I do uh, expert witness um, for um, medical malpractice, um, and uh, you know, I said, "Where did you get my name?" Well, they got my name. It turns out from the textbook where I wrote a chapter on transgender reactions. Um, and that was why was I asked to do it because I was from Yale. I mean, it's all pickup sticks. Everything you do is kind of, you know, correct. Uh, but you don't go there saying I'm representing Yale, you know, when you're doing you kind of testifying. And I don't do it, you know, in excess. I report it in the conflict of interest office and so forth. And uh, as I said on one of those slides, I was on the scientific advisory board of the company, but I wasn't getting on a rare area because I didn't think getting anything. Uh, would be with uh, the optics would not be good. A lot of times it's the optics, the other things appear uh, to the university. You don't want to put them in an office teaching. And we got people at very high levels. So we have had uh, very, very senior faculty that have had some problems um, you know, with disclosures and things with journal articles. And it can get very complicated. And we're sometimes we're boxing above our, our weight level. So that's why we rely on the provost uh, who can help. And the provost is just one step below the president of the university. So uh, 
uh, we, we seek that help and, and uh, advice. We were told that they would, that the provost level wanted to know what the committee's thoughts were first. So it's not, don't give us the problem. You deal with the problem, tell us what you came up with, and then we'll enhance and, and discuss it further. Uh, and they can be very, very difficult issues. Uh, trying to, the faculty are very clever. They can come up with some, some very, they put all the money in, in their children's uh, game and not theirs. That doesn't matter. Disclosure is your wife and your children. If your wife is getting or your husband is getting eighty thousand dollars from a company you're doing a clinical study for and you have to cap the 10k that eighty thousand pounds for is that cap and you do multiple studies for that company it's all the same company it's company center so it's not that you can get ten thousand for each study you do for market you do the market is ten thousand a year per calendar year unless there are other circumstances i'm sorry no uh, no, you know, I, was, I hear a lot about limitations and restrictions, but nevertheless, you know, the fact that the university does encourage that itself, it is part of their mission to disseminate information. So, sitting on the board of directors um, for some professional societies, like board of directors, some board, you know, um, even though it has to be disclosed, doesn't mean that it's not an activity that you participate. So um, I just wanted to balance that. Yes. Uh, we're not trying to uh, limit um, collaboration. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much.